suffering at the hands of Rome, cause they believed in Christ alone. They died through Europe, especially Spain, for they saw all but Christ is vain. He suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin. Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand. The Roman popes rule the land. Those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy. We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie, with 50 million reasons why. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Okay, continuing, he says, one of the avowed objects of the quote-unquote Catholic Defense Society is the removal from our statute book of the coronation oath of the Act of Settlements, which limit the possession of the Crown of England to Protestants. Okay, that's the main objective of the Catholic Defense Society is to remove from the from the coronation oath that the crown will uphold the Protestant faith. Okay. Now, Cardinal Manning considers that Rome has the full right to depose Protestant sovereigns. After all, according to the Third and Fourth Vatican Councils, Protestant sovereigns are heretics to be destroyed, let alone have their crowns removed. So, to get that done, the Catholic Defense Society is attempting to have removed from the oath of coronation from the English crown any avowal to the Protestant religion. Now, it says again, Cardinal Manning considers that Rome, that is the Vatican, the papacy, has the full right to depose a Protestant sovereign. Isn't that the original self-proclaimed authority of the papacy? That he alone in the world has the power to seat and to unseat kings? See, this is what happens when you give up your Protestantism. You defer to the pope the Antichrist claimed to be king of kings. And if the Pope is the king of kings, he's also the king of queens too, isn't he? So there goes your English crown. There goes your queen of England that's supposed to uphold. She swears an oath to uphold the Protestant faith. That's what England's faced with. Now, quoting, he says, the election of a prince in a Christian community cannot be put in the category of a purely civil act. If, therefore, an heretical prince is elected, that is, a Protestant prince is elected or succeeds to the throne, the church, that is, the Roman Catholic Church, has the right to say, I annul the election or... I forbid the succession. Or again, if a king of a Christian nation falls into heresy, 
He commits he commits a, an offense against God and against his people. Therefore, it is in the power of the church, the Roman Catholic Church, by virtue of the supreme authority in which she is vested by Jesus Christ over all Christian men to depose such a prince in punishment of his spiritual crime and to preserve his subjects from the danger of being led by his precept and example into heresy and spiritual re rebellion, unquote. That's Roman Catholic canon law. Roman Catholic canon law says plainly that the Pope is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So every king or every lord serves under the authority of the papacy. And any time the pope, at his discretion, wishes to relieve from duty a prince or a king or a queen or a potentate, he does so as if he were Christ on earth. He continues, he says, there's no mistaking this doctrine. Antichrist. Antichrist Pope Leo XIII has a perfect right to depose Queen Victoria. Nay, more. It would be a, bur a bounden duty for him to do so if he had the power. He has not. And he's never likely to have that power. But meantime, we have foolishly given him the power to cause serious political trouble in her realm and he is availing himself of the full op, uh, the, the, to the full of the opportunity. So what's Henry Grattan going to say? England has just simply kowtowed to the papacy. The one that England used to call the Antichrist, they've now just kowtowed to him and given him the, you look, if you give the Pope an inch, he's going to take a mile. He presents himself to the world as the vicar of the replacement of Christ on earth. You begin to negotiate with the papacy, you're going to lose. He is the Antichrist of the Bible. And he's going to create a global world under his sole sovereign rule. That is his manifest destiny. If God's people will permit it. And what Henry Grattan Guinness is saying is God's people have permitted it. He says this is to be observed no antiquated claim quoted from medieval times. It is published in England in this 19th century by one who is styled Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster. And it is no mere theory, no mere fancy sketch. It is a working drawing. An as an architect would say, a practical scheme which Rome is steadily endeavoring to carry out. The chances of his ever bringing England back under the sway, back under his sway, that is, Roman Catholic popish sway, are very remote, says Henry Grattan Guinness. I happen to disagree. Rome has, or England has been completely conquered by now by the papacy. And he says, but, quote, he says, but if, quote, home rule, unquote, could be obtained for Ireland, it becomes at once, at that very instance, a papal kingdom and a perpetual menace to England. What did Henry Grattan just get in Guinness just say? There was a chant in Ireland for home rule. That means independence for Ireland. Ireland is predominantly Catholic. The whole southern seven-tenths of, of Ireland is Roman Catholic. Only a small minority in Northern Ireland are Protestant. And the minute you grant home rule to Ireland, then Ireland becomes exclusively Catholic and becomes a threat to England, Protestant England. He says, this, therefore, is an object to be attained by any and every means, home rule for Ireland. He says, the chief result of home rule is to be the extirpation of Protestantism in Ireland. 
That's step number one. And it says the woes of Ireland are due to one single cause, the existence of Protestantism in Ireland. The, the remedy can only be found in, it, in the removal of that which causes evil. Would that every Protestant meeting house were swept from the land. That's the attitude of Rome with regard to Protestants in Ireland and Irish uh, control by Protestant England. You see, if you make Ireland independent, then you, by ipso facto, make Ireland Roman Catholic. And then Ireland as a whole becomes a threat to Protestant England. It's all about religion. It's all about Romanism versus the Reformation. He says, then would Ireland recover herself and outrages be unknown, unquote. That this attempt would be made is not to be questioned. Cardinal Manning insists that it is a sin and even an insanity to hold that men have an inalienable right to liberty of conscience and of worship or to den deny that Rome has the right to repress by force all religious observance save her own, or to teach that Protestants in a Catholic country should be allowed to exercise their religion. Okay? Roman Catholic canon law demands that the state-sponsored religion of every nation should be Roman Catholicism, and that Roman Catholicism should not and will not tolerate any other religion. In the Roman Catholic faith, there is no such thing as liberty of conscience, liberty of religion, liberty of speech, liberty of conscience. Never in the history of the Roman Catholic Church have they ever willingly accepted religious liberty or liberty of conscience or liberty of religion or liberty of speech. Those rights and liberties came solely because of the Protestant Reformation. The rebellion against the self-proclaimed vicar of Christ, which we know to be the Antichrist. Further, he says, quote, Catholicism, says a Romish magazine, is the most intolerant of creeds. It is intolerance itself because it alone is truth itself. The impiety of religious liberty is only equaled by its absurdity, unquote. So they call religious liberty absurdity. Where does that put Protestantism? He says, conceive what home rule in Ireland would be in the light of these statements. The most important point to be borne in mind in the consideration of this question is that Romanism is not a religion merely, but also a political system. We are, of course, bound to allow to Roman Catholics the liberty of conscience, which we claim for ourselves but we are not bound by any law, human or divine, to allow them the right to conspiring for the overthrow of our Protestant liberties, our Protestant government, and our Protestant empire. Adam Smith well says, quote, the Constitution of the Church of Rome, that is Roman Catholic canon law, may be considered the most formidable combination that was ever formed against the authority and security of civil government, as well as against the liberty, reason, and happiness of mankind, unquote. Peace and prosperity are impossible under papal and priestly rule, as all history attests. Quote, the papacy, says Prince B Bismarck, has ever been a political power, which with the greatest audacity and with the most momentous consequences has interfered in the affairs of this world, unquote. 
The question before our country now is whether we are willing to make a further and most decisive advance on the road in which we have already traveled too far and to grant to an alien and antagonistic political power a most real practical supremacy over five million of the Queen's subjects in Ireland, including a million of loyal Protestants in that land. I cannot close these lectures without urging you to study this subject more thoroughly and to get well grounded in your Protestant principles. A dangerous laxity on doctrinal matters marks the present day. Multitudes hardly know what they believe or why they believe what they do. In Protestant Reformation days, people knew the ground on which they had become Protestants. But we have been so long sheltered behind the bulwarks erected by our fathers that we've forgotten that we may have to defend our own civil and religious liberties and neglected to furnish ourselves with arms for the conflict. It does not do, however, to be unprepared and defenseless in these perilous times. Let me urge you to read up carefully the history of the Reformation and something of the Romish controversy. Read up also the history of our country in the days of the Stuarts, when a dark conspiracy existed to enthrall England once more and to enforce our free Protestant land back under the terrible tyranny of Rome. A similar conspiracy exists again now. Call at John Kensett's 18 Paternoster Row and purchase some of his cheap and popular Protestant pamphlets. They'll open your eyes as to this great subject. Get some armor and gird it on, for believe me, you'll have to do battle for the liberties that have made England what she is to this day. Ignorance is weakness. Knowledge is power. When you know with some degree of fullness and accuracy what it is to be a Protestant, how you will prize and privilege the privilege of bearing the name and resolve that none shall rob you of it. Above all, ground yourselves firmly in comp comprehension of the three Bible four views of Romanism to which I have directed your attention. For the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. What are those three Bible four views? Those given to us, number one, by Daniel, by Paul, and by John. All three of them spoke distinctly and exclusively about the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. There can be no mistake. Above all, ground yourselves firmly in a comprehension of the three Bible four views of Romanism to which I have directed your attention. For the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. Lastly, I would urge you to avoid all tampering with the bastard Romanism, which is called ritualism or high churchism, and which abounds, alas, all over England. It is simply Romanism slightly diluted, popery disguised with a thin veil. Wherever you have a priest instead of a preacher, an altar instead of a communion table, wax candles instead of the sunshine of divine truth, ceremonial instead of sound doctrine, sacraments instead of saving grace, intoned liturgies instead of earnest, heartfelt prayers, splendid music instead of spiritual worship, gorgeous vestments instead of gospel truth, tradition and the church instead of as it is written, a crossing instead of Christ, and crossings, rather, instead of Christ, there you have Romanism, no matter what it may be called. Beware of it. However attractive the architecture and the, and the incense, the music and the solemn ceremonial. 
avoid it like the plague. Think of the apostles in their upper chamber. Remember that Judaism gave us, quote, a shadow of things to come, unquote, not a model to be imitated, and that all this outward show is not worship, not in spirit and in truth, such as God our Father seeks from his people now. The apostle Paul styles this sort of thing a return to the, quote, weak and beggarly elements, unquote, to bondage and saying of those who in this day have been beguiled by ceremonies, I am afraid of you, etc. Let not these things beguile you from the simplicity in Christ. What? Will you play with a poisonous snake because it is gaily speckled back? Because it has bright colors? Because it's pretty? Will you fondle a poisonous snake just because it's beautiful? That's what he's saying. Keep clear of all danger to your eternal interests. The pitfalls of popery are concealed by fair flowers, but they will nonetheless be your ruin if you fall into them. The Bible brands it as anti-Christianity. Listen to him. Listen to Henry Grattan Guinness. The Bible brands Roman Catholicism as anti-Christianity and traces its origin to Satan, not to Christ. I warn you to stand aloof from the whole thing if you would be involved in its solemn judgments. If you, rather, if you would not be involved in its solemn judgments. Look, the Bible, just as it foreviews the rise of the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church, it likewise foreviews its destruction with Christ's return. That's why we have in Revelation chapter 18 the words, Come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins and that you receive not also of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. He has not forgotten one iniquity created by this church. You don't want to be a part of it. You don't want to be deceived by it. And you don't want to be found wittingly or unwittingly within it when he comes. There is no reformation of the Roman Catholic Church. It is what it is prophesied to be. It will be what it is prophesied to be. And it will be destroyed as it is prophesied to be. Do not ecumenically reunite with the Roman Catholic Church. You stand in solemn judgment of the God of glory. That's what Henry Grattan Guinness is telling his listeners. In Protestant England, you've bought the, the futurist lie. You've given Rome its power. And if you do not repent, you will be found deceived by her. You'll be found within her. Henry Grattan Guinness understands the solemn uh, treachery that Rome is perpetrating in, in England at this time. He says, remember that there is only one mediator between God and man. Okay, the man Christ Jesus, not the Pope and not his priests. That's what Henry Grattan Guinness is saying. Remember that there is only one mediator between God and man, that there is but one sacrifice for sin. Jesus Christ on the cross, not the mass. He was offered once and for all, forever. He's never to be crucified again. That's not what is taught in the Roman Catholic Church, but that he must be crucified over and over and over and over on the altar of every Roman Catholic Church. It's false religion. It's anti-Christianity. He says, through the one mediator, by the one sacrifice, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. You need no mediator between yourself and Christ. The priest is a false intruder there. Jesus calls you to come to himself alone. He is both human and divine. He is bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh, yet without sin. God is in him. He is one with us and one with God. Suffer nothing to come between you and your soul and him. Suffer 
no saint, no angel, no virgin, no priest, no pope to come between you and Jesus Christ. Go to him and him alone for the pardon of your sins. Make to him and him alone your confessions. He and only he can absolve you and will. Yea, he does if you truly believe in him alone. Priestly absolution is a lie. It is a blasphemous pretense. The sentence that the priest gives you after you confess your sins to him says, I absolve thee. By what authority does a priest have to absolve anybody of anything? A sinful, wicked priest. Only the truly righteous can absolve us of anything. And there's but one, Christ Jesus. He says the sentence, I absolve thee, spoken by a priest, whether from the mouth of the Roman Catholic priest or even a Protestant minister, is profane. Be not deluded by it. Your fellow sinner cannot absolve you from the sins you have committed against God. Turn from these idols and vanities. Jesus is all you need. His blood is sufficient to atone and cleanses those who simply trust in him from all their sins. Search the scriptures. They testify of him alone. Come to him alone that you may have life. His heart is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. None can sympathize with us as he can. None can help us as he and he alone can. To you, to each one, he says, him that cometh unto me, <clears throat> I will in no wise cast out. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Thou alone art all we need. For thou alone art all in all. That is the Protestant truth. Henry Grattan Guinness spoke the Protestant truth, and it is directly contradictory to the teachings, <clears throat> beliefs, and practices of the popes, the cardinals, the bishops, the priests, and the parishioners of the Roman Catholic Church. If there's ever been made a case in literary history of so much proof that irrefutably proves who the Antichrist is and what this church is, it's Henry Grant and Guinness in this book, Romanism and the Reformation. It is a key principal part of the Protestant faith. It should be read by every Bible-believing Protestant, and I highly recommend it to Roman Catholics, too. Because we all have until we die to come to the knowledge of the truth, the saving grace of Jesus Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, Jesus Christ alone, the King James Bible alone, and to God only be the glory. There's no room for a pope or a priest when the throne is full of God and his Son. The ecumenical movement is a diabolical movement of Satan itself. It's a repudiation of the Protestant Reformation and all that we've learned out of nearly 2,000 years of Protestant sacrifice, bloody slaughter by the man of sin in Rome. It is a repudiation of the blood of the saints of Almighty God. Henry Grattan Guinness sees England making that terrible turn. And we see it in full swing here in the United States of America in 2017. Don't be a part of the ecumenical movement. <clears throat> That's all I have. 
Thanks, well, sure. Maybe you should comment on it when you read this on your program or when you, you deal with this. Make the comments. No, it's <clears> just because, you know, there was um, one hour of reading and then one hour of discussion, so I thought maybe we could talk about a few things. All right. But if you want to finish right. it, go ahead. No, if you want to finish it, it's, no, it's, go it's, ahead. it's, it's we'll okay. Discuss it. We'll discuss it. <laughs> Well, I, I found it very interesting when you were speaking about the two witnesses uh, of the Revelation, because um, in, in the book of Revelation, there are two passages, um, a few passages where it speaks about the two witnesses. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them is, if I'm not mistaken, in Revelation 11, uh, verse 3, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand and two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. And uh, we know that from the teaching of uh, Walter Veit and the SDA, um, they they say that um, uh, uh, with the French Revolution, the two witnesses were laying in the streets. Something like that is yeah. what the SDA teaches, if I'm not mistaken, right? I'm not certain about that, but that seems about right, yeah. Yeah, and <clears throat> it was quite a little bit different from what you read here. And another point that uh, caught my, uh, my, my attention was when you were speaking about the Edict of Nantes yeah. and the revocation of it. Mm -hmm. um, I find that highly interesting because there are a few books w that I read that mentioned the Edict of Nantes. One is, one is um, uh, from Alexander Hislop, mm -hmm. um, The Two Babylons. Mm -hmm. uh, he goes into uh, Père de la Chaise, who was the confessor, mm -hmm. the Jesuit confessor, yep. to... Uh, King Louis the Fourteenth. Louis the Fourteenth. That's correct. Who then uh, revoked the Edict of Nantes? Yes, that was Jesuit uh, manipulation of the uh, of first the Parliament and then the King, and their object throughout all of it was to get that edict revoked. Yeah, and Alexander Hislop writes uh, very eloquently in his book The Two Babylons how De La Chaise did that. Yes, that he convinced the King that the souls of these Protestants were lost anyway because they couldn't find the kingdom of Christ with their teaching of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And that in that way, he got him so far uh, to revoke the Edict of Nantes. Mm -hmm. And then Henry Gerton Guinness mentioned here yeah, that 400,000 Huguenots left France. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand that a big part of those just went to the neighboring countries. They were craftsmen. Uh, like carpenters and blacksmiths. Yes, they were tradesmen. They were very talented people. They were. Yeah. They were a, a good part of the French economy. They were the backbone. They were the backbone of the nation. They were the backbone of France. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and uh, when these people left into the neighboring countries, which are Germany, uh, in the foremost part, because I don't think that many part departed to Italy, <laughs> <laughs> but to Germany and of course to Flanders. Uh, the Low Countries, um, Netherlands, as we call it today, and there arose out uh, people. Um, there arose out people like Limborch, who was mentioned before in this book, who wrote um, the the work of the history of the Inquisition in 1692. That is seven years after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes that he wrote that book. He was a Protestant living in the Netherlands. Yeah, the Protestant talent. He of witnessed. France. He witnessed. Yeah. He witnessed the, the 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 incoming, let's call it with modern terms, quote unquote, the flood of refugees, unquote, mm -hmm. that came from France into the Netherlands, mm -hmm. because of the persecution, mm -hmm. and that probably spurred him on to write that book, the history of the Inquisition. Certain can't argue with that. Those are just a few things that, when you were reading, I thought, oh, this is interesting to, to yeah. think about and, and to speak about <clears> in this regard. And also, uh, a few pages later, um, we uh, again had another explanation from Henry Gerton Guinness about the 1260 years. Yeah. Uh, the three and a half um, uh, periods of time, the, the time, time two months, dividing of time, the time, times and dividing of time. Yes. Yeah. From 312 to 476, ending in 1697, yeah. 1698. So now we have Again, three explanations of that 1260 year that differs. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But it, it, it's it's so interesting because actually when you think about it, the hijacking of 
Emperor Constantine of the real Christianity mm -hmm. and making that the state religion of the at that time pagan Roman Empire yeah. can be counted, of course, as one of the starting points, right? Well, I certainly can't argue with it. It's not my favorite subject. I'm not an expert on the subject, and it's still a quandary for me. It would be interesting in that regard, because in Revelation <clears throat> 2, we read about the church that she will go into a 10-day tribulation. This 10-day tribulation of Revelation chapter 2, if I'm not mistaken, is the time between 303 and 313, where the Christians have been most severely persecuted by the Roman pagan empire. Yeah. And because they just could not eradicate the true Bible-believing Christians from the face of the earth, mm -hmm. Constantine came to power, had his battle at the Milvian Bridge, mm -hmm. and then garnered himself with the mantle of Christianity. Yeah. It's, it's where we get the expression, if you can't beat them, join them. If you can't beat them, join them. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, just because Henry Gretton Gillis mentions 312, that is one year before the 10-day tribulation. And, of course, in, uh, in, uh, in prophecy, I don't have to tell you that. In prophecy, a day stands for a year. This 10-day persecution of the saints uh, in Revelation stands for 10 years, and this is from 303 to 313. 312 falls exactly in that period. And when you reckon from there 1260 years, well, mm -hmm. well, then, then you have the beginning of the Reformation, right? And how did they persecute the Christians during those 10 years? By feeding them to the lions in the Colosseum. They made sport and lighting them, of them as, as and, candles. And in doing so, they were mocking the prophet Daniel, who prophesied the coming of the Messiah. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's all linked. It's a spiritual battle. Everything has significance that one doesn't mm -hmm. recognize right off the bat until he understands it in the context of Bible prophecy. Then you understand. Yeah. yeah. And um, <clears throat> what you were just reading is actually giving a little bit of hope to Protestants. Yes, but it, he's punctuating it but. with a caution because Rome is gaining back the ground she lost in England at the time we're reading about right now in the book. Yeah, the, the a uh, solemn warning. The, to the picture, the picture, the picture he paints about the growth of Protestants compared to the growth of Protestants uh, uh, of Romanists, of course, seems uh, very positive for that movement in the first. Glan at first glance, but when you take a little deeper look, you know that in 1830 the Oxford movement started mm -hmm. and uh, the law was revoked that uh, forbade um, uh, Roman Catholicism, mm -hmm. uh, the, the so-called Emancipation Act, I think it was in 1829 or 1830. Yeah. And with the revoking of the Emancipation Act, uh, Roman Catholicism got a second breath, right? And this second breath they filled their lungs with exactly at that time, because you know that better than anyone, Tom, because you read *Rome and Civil Liberty* by James Aitken Wiley, uh, which was written 20 years before the publishing of this book from Henry Reckon Guinness in 1887. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, *Rome and Civil Liberty* was published in 1865, mm -hmm. if I'm yep. not mistaken and written somewhere in, uh, in, in, in that uh, time regard. And there we see an absolutely revival of Roman Catholicism. And when we compare that to today, after we have had in 1929 the uh, healing of the wound, I'd like to call it, with the Lateran Treaty, because between 1870 and 1921, uh, 1929, not one pope left the Vatican, mm -hmm. right? right? He made it a prison. It was a prison where the key was on the inside. Mm -hmm. Only when the Vatican was given back the temporal power that it lost in 1870 by giving up the last papal states to the then formed 
Republic of Italy, the papacy came out again, and then it came out in all its force that showed itself violently in the Third Reich in Germany. Yep. Where came into fruition everything Pope Leo X told the German Kaiser when he said to the Kaiser, and that is something that you can read in the memoirs of the German Emperor, that that the uh, that the that the Pope told the Emperor that Germany must be must become the sword of the Roman Catholic Church. And even though that the Kaiser said, but we don't live in the times of the uh, 1260 years anymore of the uh, paramount reign of the Roman Catholic Church, times have changed. Still, the Pope insisted on what he said to, to the Kaiser. And you see, with the First World War and, of course, the Second World War that was instigated by Hitler in the time, um, that they did exactly that. Mm -hmm. And the power that the Roman Catholic Church had from that moment on is a very, very <coughs> strong revival. I think it's even a much stronger revival than the Protestant revival that Henry Grecken Guinness was talking about here in this book. How so where did the revival come from? You tell me. You've already mentioned it. The Oxford Movement. And what was the Oxford Movement? The infiltration of the Jesuits into the Protestant seminaries of England that suggested a future Antichrist. This is where futurism was injected into Protestant Christianity. And because the Protestants began to embrace the idea that the Antichrist is not the Pope of Rome, as was previously and always believed before, and that the Antichrist was a future individual, they were exonerating the papacy. And they believed in their own heart of hearts that they had the Protestant Reformation was a grievous error. Okay? The Jesuits mm -hmm. infiltrated the lie of futurism. This is what took place during the Oxford Movement. That's the, the whole purpose of the Oxford Movement was to inject futurism into Protestantism as a poison cup because they knew that if the Protestants, as all Catholics did beforehand, were taught that the that the Antichrist of the Bible, as the Roman Catholic Church has historically taught, that the Antichrist spoken of in the Bible was was Nero or somebody from the pagan Roman Empire, or or the Antichrist might be somebody on the in the on in the uh, a far distant future. It cannot be the papacy. Okay, and it worked to silence dissent within the church, within the Roman Catholic Church. So they simply took that tried and tested false teaching and put it in the Oxford movement and, and contaminated Protestantism with it. Yeah, the Oxford and so movement now, actually was the, the starting of... If the Protestants now believe, now believe that the papacy is not the Antichrist of the Bible, then they have committed a, 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 a grievous sin against the papacy, the legitimate throne of God on the earth, the papacy, and so Rome had every jurisdiction, every justification to reconquer Protestant Europe for the Pope. And they sought the help of the Kaiser to do that and finally accomplish it during uh, the, the, uh, the dictatorship of uh, Adolf Hitler if because of futurism. It was the, the, you could, the key weapon, the secret weapon of the Counter-Reformation was futurism. And, and European history... Uh, from that time forward, has been dictated by the papacy. You could actually say, I think, in other words, that the, with the Oxford movement, that was the start of the ecumenical movement yes. and the charismatic movement, yep. which led, which led to its culmination in the 1960s and the Second Vatican Council, uh, where now we are a little bit 50 years after that. Uh, we see the fruits of this almost 200 year going on worship. Sure, the Oxford mean. movement, the future, the, the futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy has defined history from that point on. It's total apostasy. Hmm. The things we're talking about in this book, uh, uh, Grattan Guinness knew about and warned about. 
Grattan Guinness knew uh, that they, that the, the old orthodoxy of true Bible-believing Christendom was being under, undermined. That they were teaching about a future Antichrist and exonerating the papacy in the process. Henry Grattan Guinness knew Daniel's prophecy about the little horn and who it was. And he saw England repudiating that belief. So did James Aiken Wiley. So did Spurgeon. So did Spurgeon, of course, yes. Yep. And J.C. Riles. Yep. 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 So the great warning that Henry Grattan Guinness now is giving in the book at this late stage in the book is a solemn warning to Protestant England you surrender your Protestantism, you're opening the door for papal supremacy, and that's you're going to get. And that's what we got. You said, that, you said that very eloquently one of these days. Futurism is the victory of Romanism over Protestantism. That's it. Yep. I did not find any other words that could say that more eloquently yeah. <laughs> as you stated that some time ago. So, really very well done. Quote. I see the great apostasy. I see the desolation of Christendom. I see the smoke and ruins. I see the reign of monsters. I see those vice gods that Gregory the Seventh, that Innocent the Third, that Boniface the Eighth, that Alexander the Sixth, that Gregory the Thirteenth, that Pius the Ninth, I see their long succession, I hear their insufferable blasphemies, I see their abominable lives, I see them worshipped by blinded generations, bestowing hollow benedictions, bartering, lying indulgences, creating a paganized Christianity. I see their liveried slaves, their shaven priests, their celibate confessors. I see the infamous confessional, the ruined woman, the murdered innocents. I hear the lying absolutions, the dying groans. I hear the cries of the victims. I hear the anathemas, the curses, the thunders of the interdicts. I see the racks. I see the dungeons, I see the stakes, I see that inhumane inquisition, those fires of Smithfield, those butcheries of St. Bartholomew, that Spanish armada, those unspeakable dragonates, that endless train of wars, that dreadful multitude of massacre. I see it all and in the name of the ruin it has brought in the church and in the world, in the name of the truth it has denied, the temple it has defiled, the God it has blasphemed, the souls it has destroyed, in the name of the millions it has deluded, the millions it has slaughtered, the millions it has damned. With holy confessors, with noble reformers, with innumerable martyrs, with the saints of ages, I denounce it as the masterpiece of Satan, as the body and soul and essence of Antichrist. Unquote. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much for bringing this reading to an end after all these years, <laughs> which, of course, the people do not know that it started in 2014, but... I think um, what you just read here on this last page, uh, the very first sentence on the top of page 396 reads, Suffer no saint, no angel, no virgin, no priest to come between you and Jesus Christ. Henry Gretton Guinness here absolutely exposes the Roman Catholic false agenda of the Virgin Mary as mediatrix when the Roman Catholic Church teaches that Jesus Christ is the way to the Father, but only through Mary, 
you come to Jesus Christ. We have had the dogma of um, the virgin birth in the 1850s by Pope Pius IX. We have had the dogma of the ascension of Mary by Pope Pius XII in the 1950s. And we are going to have one of these days the Roman Catholic dogma of the mediatrix, the co-mediatrix of the so-called Queen of Heaven, of the Virgin Mary in the Roman Catholic Church. And your comment on the ecumenical movement is something that I, at least now, in 2017, understand much better than I first got to know you in 2014. I always laughed when you were speaking about the Evangelibellies. I didn't even understand what that was all about because I was a baby Christian at that time much more than I am now and I had no idea what the ecumenical movement is but I have read All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael de Semlian and you are for the moment uh, you have already started to read the um, next book that Michael de Semlian put out in the same spirit the foundations under attack on First Amendment Radio, and that is your work that you are doing right now, also dealing with the ecumenical movement. And neither the foundations under attack nor all roads lead to Rome say something that has not been said before. There is nothing new under the sun, people. But when Tom says, read Romanism and the Reformation, that book made the biggest impact on me ever next to the Bible. I said then in 2014, I repeat it now in 2017 until I take the last breath of my life. Romanism and the Reformation from Henry Gretton Guinness is next to the Bible, the most important book for a Bible-believing Christian to read. And even not for, no, not even for every Bible-believing Christian, for everyone who calls himself a Christian, for everyone who does not believe in evolution, who seeks Christ, who seeks God. Read the Bible and read Romanism and the Reformation and you will gain an understanding as you have never understood things before. Are there some closing remarks that you want to do, Tom, for the for the um, bringing to an end this broadcast of the last reading of Romanism and the Reformation. Maybe you have some comments on things that I just said. Listen, I, I, I think this, after the reading uh, of Romanism and the Reformation, anything that I would say would be anticlimactic. i just <laughs> leave it go. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, then we're just going to take my closing remarks for it. And, okay. uh, I thank I thank everybody for listening. I thank you, Tom, for coming so spontaneously uh, to the microphone tonight and uh, reading the missing pages of that broadcast that we missed in 2014 and bring that now in 2017 to an end. What a wonderful start of my Sabbath today on the 3rd of March because the sun is already down here for since a few hours and I'm enjoying my Sabbath and Tom gave me this wonderful present of studying with him the last pages of Romanism and the Reformation. So I hope that you enjoyed the viewing of the video and listening to Tom's and my voices and you will pick up that book and start reading and do what Jesus Christ asked us to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Until next time, thank you very much for watching and listening. Bye-bye, and God bless you. Okay, I'm going to go get yeah. some fresh air. Yeah, like you wanted already before, so I'm very <laughs> much sorry that I kept you inside. But I, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just wonderful. It, it really, this is the most wonderful Sabbath present I could have ever imagined to have. I, I thank you so much for doing that. Well, thank Henry Grant and Guinness. Yeah, he wrote the book, yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I, will. I just I read will. it. That's all I did. I just read it with understanding, but I read it. That's all I did. Yeah, it is. It is just this understanding that makes that book so wonderful. It's you know, it's the same like with um, the Global Vatican. That's right. If you don't read it with understanding, it doesn't. <laughs> it's not going to mean anything to you. No, it's not going to mean anything. That's right. 
That's that was just a wonderful work. So okay, I have my work to cut this audio in pieces and uh, to bring it all together. But thank you, thank you, thank yep. you, Tom, for bringing this to an end. And now I have all the recordings that I need. I can push that book out, Romanism and the Reformation, and I will. And um, I can tell you, um, there are even comments uh, in 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 these videos. So whenever you have the time, when you have some half an hour leisure time before in front of your computer, just go to my channel, go to the play playlist Inquisition Update. I, I have a whole playlist just called Inquisition Update and in that you find all the videos I produce of uh, your audios. Romanism and the Reformation, all the little things that I cut out from Global Vatican, from the archives of 2014, from the discussions that you did on these calls and all that stuff. And uh, you can just uh, have a look here and have a look there not only on the videos but also on the comments in there and i think that you will appreciate it and when you look at the counts you will see that your word is spread i at least do my part and i promote this on three channels because i have three channels so on the one channel it's more on my main channel it's the most of course but yeah, well, you know there's one channel only only dedicated to you yeah well, there is nothing there's no other video on but a video of you and that already has 2000 views so not so much but it's that, eh? Yeah. It's that. Yep. That message has to go out. We are this little flame, Tom. This is the way that I see the ministry that you are doing, the ministry that I try to do, and I think also the ministry that Brett is doing in his way. We are this little flame that survived that war that the papacy was raging on us at the end of the 15th yeah. and uh, to the start of the 16th century, where you read today, where the church was so triumphant we got it yeah. and no they did not because here and there god knows his people and here and there there is still a little light in the darkness a little lamp in the dark to say it with the words yeah. of christian pinto what was it uh one of the martyrs of jesus in england said play the man because we're about to start a flame in england the likes of which will never go out or words to that effect yeah, just a little flame. So, a flame turns into a conflagration if it's uh, blessed by the Spirit of God. So, it's up to Him to do His part. Now we've done our little part. So, well, was, to Him uh, only be the glory. I'm going to be dead. Bishop Letterman. I'm going to be dead and gone soon, and uh, it's all going to be up to somebody else to carry this torch. Yeah, what, what you just said, Tom, that was Bishop Latimer and Ridley yep. when they were Ridley. taken to the yep. to the uh, to the stake. Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day, by God's grace, light such a candle in England as I trust shall never be put That's out. That's it. That's it. Okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah, I see you tomorrow, Tom. Yep. Have a nice day. Bye. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.